Hi everybody. If you're like me, you immediately notice the Apple G4 Cube behind me. Now this is a 20 year old machine made in the year 2000 by Steve Jobs and really Johnny Ive. And it has not aged a day. It is the most gorgeous computer that has ever been built. But this is no ordinary Apple G4 Cube. No, this is an i9-9900K, the fastest, most packed G4 Cube Hackintosh in the world. Okay, so I'm just kind of saying that, but prove me wrong. I went into this project a full Apple fan. I mean, look at this thing. Look at your iPhone that you're watching this on, or an iPad. They just make beautiful products. And as soon as I saw that somebody had made a Hackintosh out of an Apple G4 Cube, I knew that it could be done. So I dove headfirst into PC building, small form factor PC building, case modding, and of course, the robust Hackintosh community. Come take a tour with me and see a bit about the process it took to get this machine into this. Okay, yeah, okay, I see that the two of those look exactly the same, which is kind of the point of my Hackintosh. I wanted my mod to look like the original. So, I succeeded. Let's get started. I originally bought the Cube used and without a working DVD drive, already semi-disassembled for about $150, which is kind of high for a non-working unit. I found a second cube for almost half of what I paid for the first and left it in its original condition. You just kind of have to get lucky. The first step was to take apart all the pieces from the old cube. Here I am struggling to get the old cube apart. Many of the cables have been oxidized and parts roughly put together. There's the GPU. There I am removing screws. I wasn't precious with any of these parts because there was no guarantee that they would work. It had already been disassembled. And here's the SCSI cable. Ooh, and I don't know what I'm doing here. Back at the starting stage, I barely knew what I had in my hands. I just kind of have a screwdriver and have at it. Really what you're left with is a top piece, a bottom piece, and these four corner beams that make up the cube. And finally, the piece de resistance, which is your handle and locking mechanism. Nothing should interfere with that beautiful locking handle. And it's time to build a Hackintosh. Okay, from this to this. And what we've miniaturized it into is an eight inch cube. An eight-inch cube. Unbelievable. Eight inches? That's, quick calculation, 8.4 liters. And once you remove the plastic outer shell and the thick aluminum cube, you're really left with 6.75 inches on each side. And that's just five liters of space to work with. How do you fit a computer in dimensions that small? Yeah, okay, so Apple did it back in 2000, but modern day computers? It's 20 years later. When I first started, I really knew nothing, but I knew my computer needs a motherboard. I just didn't know about the different types of motherboards. There's the standard size one, the ATX boards, and even bigger boards, the extended ATX boards. And then there's smaller ones, the micro ATX, but we have 6.75 inches of working room, or 17.145 centimeters. And luck has it, there is a mini ITX board that is exactly 17 centimeters per side. That isn't a lot of wiggle room, but it should fit perfectly. So how did I choose between the ITX boards, which could handle the i9 processor? I'm not embarrassed to say it, I went by looks. Which one looked the best? That was hands down the Asus Rogue Strix Z390i Gaming. Just looks sleek and sexy, and there's this huge heatsink on it. It must be fast if it came with that much metal. 
What happened though was when I got it back and installed the chip, I installed the Mac OS onto it and it worked fine. But then I made the mistake of updating my BIOS, which you're supposed to do. But in the Hackintosh, that's got some consequences to it. And suddenly my new Hackintosh, it no longer worked. So I sadly had to return the brand new Asus Rogue Strix. It was a blessing in disguise because I got to go with my second choice, the ASRock Z390 Phantom Gaming ITX. This one's heatsink was not nearly as cool. I mean, look at it. It's got that weird bar on it. But it turns out it's a more featured board. And the amount of cool metal on a heatsink is not the only factor in choosing a motherboard. Uh, thank you very much. And it came with the Thunderbolt 3 port, which is awesome. On to... Okay, I see that I'm losing some of you. A computer is just a microchip that all of the calculations go through and that sits on top of a motherboard. And then everything else gets plugged into that motherboard. Yeah. I went with the i9-9900K, which I had mentioned earlier, it's got eight cores and it's blazingly fast. But I'm not going to go into any detail about it here because there are plenty of resources online that you can check out if you're interested. Safe to say, it's a great processor. And then it needs RAM. RAM is where the instructions for the processor line up before they go to the processor for calculating. Kind of. And these instructions are read from what used to be disk drives, and then they became hard drives, and eventually solid state drives. And those solid state drives come on long strips now and connect to the motherboard. They're known as NVMe drives. The first NVMe drive, it goes underneath that heat sink because they produce a lot of heat, snugly protected on the top of the board. And here's the second one sitting here on the bottom of the board, exposed to the elements, all alone, no other components around it. I don't know why that doesn't get a heat sink. Okay, so a chip, a motherboard where everything gets plugged into, some RAM, and a hard drive. And yeah, that's most of your computer. But there's a lot of space left. And I wasn't gonna come this far by not pushing the limits. How do I render 3D models in AutoCAD if I only had a CPU? And yeah, true, I don't work for Pixar, and I don't actually know AutoCAD or what it does, and I don't really play Crisis at 140 frames per second. I only edit YouTube videos. Still, I'm gonna need a graphics card. And I know what you're thinking. You fit a graphics card in there? Yeah. I fit a graphics card in there. This is a single slot ITX mini graphics card. Enough for running some pretty non-demanding games and definitely enough for running two external monitors. Graphics cards are kind of like the CPU in that they are chips which just crunch numbers. But while the central processing unit, or CPU, we discussed earlier, is designed to handle extremely complicated math equations, the graphics processing unit is designed to handle simple math equations. Lots and lots of simple math equations. And therefore, it's usually working in conjunction with graphics. And there, that's it. That's your computer. It just needs to be plugged in. And here's where I made an improvement over Apple because Steve Jobs and Johnny Ive never figured out how to get a whole power supply brick into the machine because really it's a tight space, but I did. I found a 400 watt power supply unit I put the PSU inside the machine, and I know what you're thinking. Is that wise? I don't know. Does that make the machine too hot? I don't know. Does putting all those components that close together pose a serious risk? Probably not. Who's to say? But I checked the dimensions and calculated that one fit, and modern supply units are pretty self-contained. So I got one in there. And finally, after all this was hooked up, I looked at the thing and realized, how do you turn it on? Hey, so I put together a computer. Now I can't tell how to turn it on.
Yeah, just plug it into the power button. Yeah, well, here's the thing. It's a vintage sort of computer, so there's not actually a power button. Oh, well, you're going to need a front panel connected power button. Interesting. And off to Amazon I went to buy a power button. With a reset button. And they threw in the power indicator and disk right LED for free. It's so nice of them. That was a long Amazon two days wait, but fire up it did. So all these parts would have to fit, but they at no point could compromise that handle mechanism. The first move was to measure out where the ITX board would sit and cut out a hole for the IO board. That's where all these cables would be plugged into, but I had never cut metal before. This is where a Dremel or rotary tool comes in. It's essentially a quick rotating drill-like tool that you can put blades on and cut through metal with. Heh, <laughs> nice. After hacking away with the Dremel for a bit, uh, it became obvious that metal is thick and heavy, and it would take a long time to Dremel through. Instead, I made a hole and hacked at it with a hacksaw. Ho! Sawing back and forth, eventually I got the hole right for where the motherboard would sit, and from there I knew where everything else would need to be placed. The original Apple Cube had an immense heat sink we saw earlier. That was this thick steel plate to collect heat on. It's a gorgeous design. It's heavy and expensive and would have to come out. I had seen the other G4 Cube mods where the person had just sawed the heat sink in half, but it is connected to the pop-up handle that cannot be messed with at any point. Cutting the heat sink in half works fine, but the structure of your cube can suffer. You have to think of a new way to make it sturdy again. That did not appeal to me. Instead, I had the crazy and frankly time-wasting idea I would cut mine down, but keep a connected piece of metal to both sides. And the metal would ensure the integrity of the structure. This meant, though, a lot more sawing. And more sawing. You can't get at it from this side because it's, it's not wide enough. And no, I've, no, I tried it that way. No, it's, it's not going to... Why is it so damn hard? Uh, I, okay, yes, okay. I can cut one piece. And then I can cut all the way down again so that... Huh. It would just be so much easier with a circular saw. But people have broken out of jail with less than this, so I can too. If I just hack away at this one side long enough, eventually it'll break free. And ah, there it is. And now it's wide enough to saw. And all these blades are quick work. And there go these chunks. Phew, one newly milled, full integrity handle contraption. Perfect. The clearance, though, is so tight that I eventually took small slivers off both sides so it would not push up against the RAM. The power supply, too, would be easy because it fit almost perfectly into the DVD player and hard drive tray. But where to put the GPU? And how to connect the GPU to the motherboard? To fit all of this in there, I used what I refer to as the sandwich technique. Now we know the processor and motherboard are gonna produce a bunch of heat, and the graphics card usually would slot in at a 90 degree angle. But this isn't possible given the placement of that stunning handle and the newly minted heat sink area. In other small form factor cases, this is typically handled by having your CPU face out one way and the GPU face the opposite way so they're both back to back and the heat escapes your case from both sides. Small form factor PC builders also call this the sandwich layout, but they are facing out. How is that a sandwich? Your bread is blowing hot air into the roof of your mouth and the bottom of your teeth. It makes no sense. My way would be the outer aluminum case as your bread and the CPU and GPU would both face in and blow hot air at each other therefore leaving the outside cool and the inside hot. You know, like a sandwich. And from there, the heat would simply rise out of the case through thermodynamics. Just kidding. 
global warming is real and we need to get serious about it, otherwise we will leave no world for our kids to inherit. Which is also why I chose to reuse a computer instead of buying a new one. Now, Steve Jobs and Johnny Ive originally designed the Apple Cube to have no fans. Our engineers spent an enormous amount of energy figuring out how to get this amazingly powerful G4 technology into this 8-inch cube and to cool it without a fan. I, on the other hand, spent an enormous amount of time trying to put as many fans in there as I possibly could. How many fans do you think are in there? One? No. Two? Not even close. It would take over 30,000 bulbs. Six. I have six fans in there. Six. The CPU is cooled with what is known as the Noctua NHL9i. It's the smallest CPU cooler with any teeth to it. It's only 37 millimeters in height. Every millimeter is so necessary. It's so small, fast, and efficient, and completely not recommended to be used with this processor. Yeah, the i9 runs far too hot to be cooled by a, a tiny cooler like that. But are we modding? Yeah, we're modding. The GPU, on the other hand, has its standard MSI stock fan. Frankly, it's no match for the Noctua but it's small enough to fit right between the space created by Apple's heatsink. So the CPU and GPU blow at each other. Not the best. I placed one very thin 15 millimeter in height exhaust fan, which is blowing up the top of the case, and two tiny 22 millimeter Noctua fans, which are stuck right at the bottom for air intake. In theory, air can get sucked up easily through the many holes all throughout the bottom of the case, but in practice, it doesn't work out that way because three sides end up being non-breathable lucite enclosure. The six fan is the small one that is self-contained in the power supply unit. That counts. That counts. Amazing cooling system through a center channel that cools the whole thing with air so that it runs in virtual silence. The G4 cube. How are the thermals? Probably not so good. To test my thermals, Actually, I don't know how I should be testing my thermals. For a while, I tried downloading some benchmarking extensions so I could keep an eye on them in my menu bar. They looked fine, so I just deleted that. And the CPU, although it reached temperatures of 80 degrees Fahrenheit, well, it's designed to work at temperatures up to 100. It will shorten the lifespan of the CPU, well, maybe, but also it throttles itself to make sure there isn't a meltdown. So, I don't know. If there's a better way of checking my thermals, please let me know in the comments below. So that was the design. The GPU plugs into the motherboard with a PCIe slot. Usually here I would be using a riser cable to connect the two. That's just a long cable. But I need it just long enough. It also takes up a lot of room. It was almost impossible to figure out. I needed a right angle to connect the end. It would have to do a U-turn underneath this GPU I had bought six different components in an attempt to connect them as snugly as possible with no leftover cable. 25 centimeters of cable bending it back onto itself, although usually not recommended, actually worked out pretty great. One thing I had to do to get the Hackintosh working was to swap out the wireless card to one compatible with Apple. Just like being stubborn about the power supply sitting on the outside of the machine, I similarly refused to have the Wi-Fi antennas dangle around on the outside. It just looks too messy for me. So in a piece of modding that amazes even me, I decided to thread the antenna wires inside the case so that they no longer were visible. And in their place where the two antennas used to attach, I stuck the old power and reset buttons I had. And right by them went the power and activity LEDs where the original power and reset buttons used to be. Of all the modding in this thing, these pieces, although not perfect, are my favorite. One of the best designs of the original G4 Cube was the non-tactile power button at the top of the case. Some modders have gotten it to work again, and I tried a few attempts to install a wireless power button or a touch sensor. I even attempted to connect a 5 volt resistor to drive the power button, but nothing I used would work through the thick plastic outer shell. This was a little out of my league. In fact, here again, I will leave it up to you. If you have a solution for a touch sensor power button that works, please leave a comment below. kind of glazed over the part about this being a Hackintosh, which means 
this machine has PC parts, but you install the Mac OS on top of that. And I could not have done this alone. I needed a lot of help from the Hackintosh community, which share their knowledge and sometimes their EFI folders to get this machine up and running. Here it is booting up. It looks like I'm a matrix hacker. Every time I get a small jolt of happiness when it switches into the Mac OS and the Apple logo comes onto the screen. Shout out to Morganaut for her insightful and easy to follow guide. Also, her excitement for Hackintosh has fueled my own. I wish I could say that was the only guide I used and it worked perfectly, but that's not true. There were months of research to know what was doing what. However, it really comes down to that hardware you use. If someone else already used it, then chances are you can get it to work for you too. I used what is known as the vanilla install method to get it working. Modern Hackintoshes are using a newer technique called OpenCore, which I am keen to try in my next build. And don't get me wrong, getting it up and running took a lot of effort. This isn't easy. There was tinkering and prodding and trying out stuff. And for a while, you might get it to install, but the installer gets stuck. Or you get it to boot, and then the sound doesn't work, or the Wi-Fi. And then you fix that, and then your Bluetooth doesn't work. Or this weird one, and none of the pictures are loading in the Finder. But eventually, I got the entire thing to work. And it works almost flawlessly. And that's an 8-core G4 Cube Hackintosh. But there's just one more thing. Oh. I really don't use it for anything else besides playing the occasional game that I can't play in my Mac. But if I have to, I can boot into Windows. That's the tour. For me, the Hackintosh process has been incredibly rewarding. Every day I get to fire up my dream computer that is both blazingly fast and incredibly loud. It has six fans. Six fans. Six fans. And will I always be able to brag about this work of art as being the fastest, most beautiful, most packed Hackintosh G4 Cube ever built? Eventually, someone will come along and build a cooler G4 Cube. But for right now, I certainly have the coolest computer in Hollywood and probably the greater LA area. And that even includes parts of the valley. Probably the only people with a cooler computer than me in the area are the super nerds at the Jet Propulsion Labs out in Pasadena. But, you know, they're rocket scientists, so that's kind of understood. Huh. Thanks for coming on this tour with me and my version of the G4 Hackintosh Cube. It's a 20-year-old machine that is as fast as the modern-day IMAX. And it's as rewarding today as the day that I built it. And hopefully, I inspired some of you to start your own case mods. So remember, there is no right way to mod a computer.